people in the marketplace here of Timberline, I really want them to think best in class. There are plenty of average people in the, in the marketplace and in the entire world in any industry you're in. We want to be exceptional. We want people to think if you want it done right and done well, you call Timberline first. And that's something I will take the most pride in is that we have that distinction as being one of the best construction managers that you know any client can hire to help them achieve their goals. Um, and so with that, we can, let's kick off the discussion and I'm going to hand it over to Secretary Keneally. Thank you. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much. And thanks for assembling this truly all-star panel today. I, I, I'm i going to vote for easy. This is going to be easy and fun. And uh, it's a terrific group. I mean, to be joined by uh, two of my predecessors, uh, an incredibly valued industry colleague and Bob and then two other industry leaders. It's a, it's a really terrific group. So uh, great to be with you. Why don't I just open up with a, with a few comments? I, don't be, I want to be somewhat brief and then hear what this panel has to say about the, the topics of the day. Uh, but uh, it has been great to get back on the road now coming out of the pandemic as, as Secretary tend to travel quite a bit. And obviously, we shut that down for a period of time last year. But among other things, I have uh, since the start of the summer done a, a 25 uh, downtown and small business tour, getting around the state, literally from as far west as Williamstown, as far east as Provincetown. We did a tour of affordable housing developments, six days, 12 communities, about 30 developments. I did a similar tour two years ago, uh, but getting back out there. And then now we're in the throes of announcing MassWorks grants and other similar grants through our, our capital grant programs here, which brought me to Bedford and Burlington and, and Lincoln and Chelmsford a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and a couple of those, by the way, have a real emphasis on life sciences. So it's been terrific to get back out on the road and, and back investing in our communities. And I, I will say one thing we've done recently, which I think is really important, is to consolidate a number of our programs into something we, something we call the one stop for growth. And so taking MassWorks and nine other programs and, and, and combining those into a single front door, if you will, to our, our capital programs, as always in our efforts to be the best partner we can be for our, our cities and towns. Um, in addition to traveling around the state, we've got a number of topics on our mind right now. Uh, as an administration. Uh, one clearly is workforce, making sure we've got a prepared workforce for today and tomorrow. We uh, released over the summer a future of work study uh, that spoke to a lot of the trends we're seeing now and, and, and really tried to describe a world where we've had obviously a fair amount of economic dislocation in some of our main street industries, if you will. We've got more people now working in remote and hybrid manner. Just, just what does the future mean for all of us? And a call out a few things we have to be really mindful of. One is, is workforce to really ramp up our workforce skills efforts. Uh, and others to build a lot more housing. Uh, and also a real focus on industry clusters that make our state unique places where the state has a natural leadership advantage. So there's a lot going on here from a housing and economic development standpoint. And uh, delighted to be with you all today. I'm looking forward to hearing what's on the mind of these, uh, these great panelists. Um, why don't I kick it off and, and ask a question uh, that is related to workforce and, and return to work plans. This may be a question best for uh, for Jay and for Deanna, but but what are you all seeing now in terms of businesses that they start to come back to the office, uh, both in terms of large and small companies? How are, how are people articulating their return to the office strategies and, and what are you actually seeing happening on the ground today? Sure, I can talk about that for a moment. So, you know, we have assets right now that I personally see on a weekly basis from Lowell to Bedford to Waltham, um, and even in Boston that have a variety of participation. But the mainstay between them all is that the larger the tenant is, the less likely it is that they are all back in the office. Smaller tenants, uh, you know, 20,000 square feet and below, they're a little more nimble. They have, um, seems like they have had a chance to develop their process for all of their employees, maybe spread out a little in the space that they're in, give everybody a comfort level. Those folks are back in the office. Um, sometimes it's still a bit of a hybrid, but they're here and you feel them. Much larger corporate tenants um, have, in our experience, still have a very small population in the office. What we're hearing from them is that they are planning returns to work right after the first of the year. Um, they also kind of said that back in September and then some things changed in the world and that pushed and now we're kind of hearing first of the year. But I do feel like people have, have gotten their plans in place. They know what they're going to do. Um, and one positive, I think that people have really come out of this and said, maybe there isn't that big scare that we're going to have to give back a lot of space. I think a lot of us were fearful of that at one moment. We're not seeing this mass exodus and give back of space. If anything, people are saying we're going to keep the space we have and spread out in a little. Jay, what do you think? 
Uh, thanks, uh, Deanna, and it's uh, it's great to be with everyone. Uh, to uh, my former um, ATD uh, colleagues, it's nice to see the Canelias in the secretary's office and not us. Uh, so, uh, Mike, I see uh, I see our old Connor office, and uh, uh, we're certainly lucky that you're manning that office. I am uh, I am calling in from uh, uh, Denver at my home and, and not finding my way to the office. Uh, I thought I'd share a couple of observations uh, that I've heard, and, and largely. Uh, uh, goes along with uh, what uh, Deanna said. Um, uh, keep in mind that uh, Massachusetts Competitive Partnership is an organization of 18 of the largest employers in Massachusetts. So I deal almost exclusively with large employers, although all of us are always talking about employers um, all around. Um, work from home uh, is still uh, working uh, for companies. And so there's no rush uh, to get people back to the office. But more importantly, flexibility is the mantra our employees. So what we're hearing from our larger companies are that we are welcoming people back to the office. We have protocols in place to protect uh, their safety and, and well-being. Uh, we encourage them to come in through providing benefits, uh, including uh, free lunches and other fun things that happen in the office space. But if people want to work from home still, uh, by and large, um, that's being allowed. Now, the exception is for those uh, employees or those companies that are really forward facing, that are really, I'm sorry, um, customer facing, um, that actually need to be in. But largely, if you can still perform your job from home, you're given the opportunity to do so. Um, Secretary Keneally, you know, we did a, um, a most recent uh, poll with the uh, Mass Technology Leadership Council. And that, uh, that poll indicated that 84% uh, of uh, workforce that can work from home is working from home. And there's a projection that into 2022, uh, that number is going to fall, but not fall substantially. Um, uh, into 2022, uh, the respondents um, suggested that um, as many as 68% of people uh, who are uh, currently working from home may still continue to work from home. So reporting to work really relates to the job function um, that you have. Um, what we're hearing from our companies is that hybrid is here to stay. Uh, I've heard from companies that have said, Two or three days a week in, two or three days a week out is largely going to be uh, the the um, the way that we uh, operate. Um, I agree that footprints are holding. Um, I'm not hearing of a lot of companies that are looking to expand. Um, conversely, I do agree that uh, footprints are holding, and, and companies are taking a wait wait and see approach. To the extent that footprints are shrinking, those were already companies that were thinking about a shrinking footprint pre-pandemic, and the pandemic has accelerated that. Um, and talking about accelerants, I hear over and over again that when it comes to the flexibility and the ability of people to work remotely, COVID just accelerated what big companies were already um, thinking about. So my last point I would emphasize is, is that it's all about talent right now. Um, and um, the companies are recognizing that it's in order to be competitive um, in this environment where uh, talent is um, as important as it is, uh, companies need to continue to be uh, flexible and responsive to employee needs. Terrific. And, and folks, sorry, I neglected to ask folks to introduce themselves. Before we move on, Deanna, maybe you could just um, introduce yourself and describe your organization. And we'll ask Jay to do, uh, do the same as well. Sure. Uh, I'm Deanna Murphy. I work with Anchorline Partners. I'm a general manager here, and we are a real estate owner, asset manager, and developer here around the Boston area. We have assets, like I mentioned, up from Lowell, like Cross Point and Lowell, um, down to Waltham. We have a collection of assets there at City Point. Most recently, we acquired um, a group of assets on Crosby Road in Bedford, and that's kind of a big focus of our operation right now. A lot of what we do is converting office space from um, office to lab, but also sustaining high-level office space as that use. So, um, so yeah, that's a little about what I'm doing. So every day I'm in, you know, one of these five offices kind of getting an on the ground view of are people there? How many people are there? How much work are we getting done? There's a lot of construction activity everywhere you go right now. So properties are very busy. Yeah, great. And uh, I'm Jay Ash. Um, I am, uh, it's, it's great to be on this panel because if not for the Greg Bileckis and Bob Coughlin's of the world, uh, who helped uh, propel uh, the city of Chelsea while I was city manager forward, I may not have been uh, asked uh, by Governor Baker to be uh, the successor to Greg Bilecki. And uh, as successor to Greg Bilecki, I looked for talent because talent is king and was able to bring Mike Keneally in um, on my team as talent and got to serve for four years um, under uh, Governor Baker. I currently am the president and CEO 
of the Massachusetts Competitive Partnership, again, uh, a organization of 18 of the largest employers in Massachusetts. And the distinction between my organization and a lot of other organizations is that the CEOs themselves uh, have to participate, have to participate in our work. So when I have a board meeting, I have the CEOs of Fidelity and Bank of America and State Street Bank and Vertex and others at the table. And uh, we're all uh, coming together uh, to promote uh, economic competitiveness. Terrific. Great. Thank you both. Let, let me let me turn to Bob Coughlin and uh, Bob ask you to uh, I'll pose a question and ask you to lead off with an introduction. But uh, Bob oh. is just a, tr a true leader in the life sciences ecosystem here and someone I've had a very long dialogue with around uh, arguably, uh, well, certainly one of our most important industry sectors here in Massachusetts. But Bob, can you talk about the demand right now you're seeing for a life sciences space? Um, what types, where, and, and what does that mean in terms of our, our need to make sure we've got a prepared workforce to fill that space? Yeah, Mike, it's a great question. And, you know, just by way of background, I've been involved with the life science industry for the last 20 years, some of it while serving in the House here in Massachusetts, some of it while serving briefly in the Patrick administration as Undersecretary of Economic Development when we actually initiated the 10-year billion dollar life science initiative. And then fo following that, the 13 plus years I spent as the CEO of MassBio. And during that time, I've had a front row seat to see us really go from the golden age of science into the platinum age. And when you ask about the demand right now in the life sciences, it is at an all time high. We were heading towards that trajectory prior to COVID. It has accelerated even more post COVID and I'll tell you real briefly why, but there typically uh, a, an above average year of demand for lab, our research development and GMP manufacturing space was you know, around two and a half to 3.2 million square feet a year. Right now, it's bouncing between eight and nine million square feet of demand right now. Now think of the fact that innovation is far outpaced what we have done to keep up with from an infrastructure standpoint. So, so right now, to have this amount of demand and literally not much at all of lab space to put these companies in has put us in, in a perplexing situation, but we're managing our way through it. So when you look at what Deanna and her firm and many other firms and what Steve and his company are working on, right now in the life sciences space, we're building more research development and GMP space than you can ever imagine. Really, really good and healthy for what we call sprawl in economic development. You got you folks all remember in the old days, it was piling everything in Kendall Square. Then we said, oh, Kendall Square is almost full. We need to build out the innovation district and the seaport district. And that became a reality. Keep in mind, a lot of people didn't think that would work back then, but it did. And Greg, we've talked so much about Cambridge Crossing and what's happened over there. That's filled up. Everything's getting filled up. So finally, ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about central Massachusetts, western Massachusetts, the northern corridor, think about what's happening in Lexington, Bedford, Burlington, and the whole Middlesex 3 coalition. That's why I was getting so excited for this talk today, because that's the hottest spot in the state right now. Because these companies, as they've moved into this golden age of cell and gene therapy and the fact that when you control your own destiny and manufacture your own products for clinical trials, this is all stuff that's happened post-COVID. Think about it. Operation Warp Speed, three vaccines invented in less than 12 months. That's miraculous. Well, if you can do it for vaccines, you can do it for Huntington's, Parkinson's, ALS, Alzheimer's, cystic fibrosis, and many others, right? So we've really accelerated how this industry has behaved. And that means a lot of these companies are going to want to build their own product for clinical trials, make their own product for clinical trials. Well, you're not going to do it in Kendall Square. You're not going to do it in the Seaport District. So it's all opened up all these opportunities. And then when you add on top of that, the fact that post-COVID, research and development folks and manufacturing folks had to work during COVID, right? They didn't miss a beat. They should all be commended for that. But right now, people don't want to sit in traffic. As traffic comes back, companies are really starting to think, why don't we put the jobs where the people live? And that's a great thing for sound, solid economic development across the Commonwealth. So I'm really, as you can tell, I'm a little excited about where the industry's at. I left MassBio to join Jones Lang LaSalle so I could be a part of helping companies with the, the challenges that they face right now in infrastructure and growth strategies, et cetera. One thing that we need to make note of, Mr. Secretary, uh, the current Mr. Secretary, right, is that we've grown so much. We didn't keep up with it from an infrastructure standpoint. My fear is that we're not keeping up with a talent and workforce development from a talent and workforce development standpoint. If we continue to grow 
at the rate that is projected, we're gonna need between 30 and 40,000 new people to join the life sciences workforce here in the Commonwealth. We can't continue to steal from company to company. We need to create new workforce. We need to focus on ED&I. We need to focus on creating an on-ramp for people who live in underserved communities in the Commonwealth. And we need to get people excited about science so that they will enter this field because we're not gonna be able to keep up with the growth if we don't bring new people into it. Terrific. Thanks, Bob. I, I can tell you the, the workforce skills efforts here are really some among the more important things we're focused on now. You bet. Uh, got a situation where you have incredibly promising sectors of the economy like life sciences, a handful of others with this real demand for talent. On the other hand, there's a large number of people that need to find a new career pathway coming out of COVID-19. So we're at an interesting moment in time where there, there's um, both sort of supply and demand, if you will, and, and ample money to put to work against some of these things. So I think you'll see us be uh, incredibly active over the next uh, year around uh, building out a life sciences workforce skills uh, strategy uh, in an even more uh, a more focused manner. But thank you, Bob, for that. Let me turn to um, uh, Greg and Steve and again, ask you to introduce yourselves as you answer the question. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on office space right now and, and demand for office space uh, in light of demands for other types of space like life sciences, manufacturing, distribution centers and other things. Just what are we seeing now in terms of the office market? Maybe start with Greg and then Steve. Great, thank you, Secretary. And it's good to be with, here with all of you. Greg Bialecki, uh, principal at Redgate. And uh, we uh, do real estate development uh, around Boston and New England and also our real estate advisors for clients all over the Eastern United States. So um, on the office side, I mean, I think Deanna made the most important point, which is uh, for all the reasons we mentioned, there's a lot of uncertainty about office usage and uh, we're still settling out of what the new normal will be. Jay gave us some hints around that. But the most important thing I think is that we have not seen those changes, even though they're, they're serious and long-term, they haven't really led to disruption in the marketplace. We don't see tenants giving back a lot of space. We don't see office landlords in distress. Uh, we don't see properties going to foreclosure. So. It's a big change, but it seems to be the it seems to be working its way through the system. Uh, and as you mentioned, Secretary, one of the ways that that's happening is a lot of that office space uh, is turning into other uses, and that's probably the hottest thing in the real estate market right now. Uh, a lot of real estate developers looking at uh, existing office properties and thinking about how to convert them to any of those list of uses that you. You mentioned um, life sciences, as Bob mentioned, both R&D and manufacturing now uh, and distribution uses and carefully looking on a building by building basis. Uh, we at Redgate actually bought an old office building right near Deanna on, on Crosby Drive, 290,000 square feet of space vacated by Oracle. Um, but we didn't miss a beat because we're going to convert it uh, to lab and we feel it's going to be very attractive and will be put back to productive use when we're able to uh, reopen it next year. So that's the, the, the system is working and we're seeing a repositioning uh, of, a lot of, this as, uh, of a lot of these assets. You do not, I mean, the reality is you're not seeing, uh, we, we would not build a new office building today. Um, and very few people are willing to do that on unless they happen to land. There are some still some good tenants in the marketplace. So uh, we've seen big announcements from Amazon and, and Google and others. Um, so there's still op there's still some new office building happening, no doubt. Um, but that's not really uh, the direction that new development's going to take. It's going to be wait and see how the existing supply works itself out. Steve, Greg, can jump in. There? Yeah. Well, first, uh, Greg, I'm glad you got to follow Bob. That's a hard act to follow, you know. <laughs> I don't know if I can bring that energy to the table, but we'll give it a shot, you know. So uh, Stephen Kelly, CEO of Timberline Construction, we're a construction manager. We work in uh, many sectors, including life sciences, the office space, which are primarily the two that we're going to discuss today. But we do a lot of work in academia, higher ed, private school, really uh, in any facet of construction, you know. So we are seeing in the office space still some activity, but I do think that that particular sector is a lot cooler than then certainly life sciences, you know, um, as protecting the, in the urban environments, I think there's a, a kind of wait and see what's going to happen in the long-term effects, but the, the, the other panels have pretty much covered it all. You know, it's going to be a more of a flexible workforce uh, on many rich campuses, uh, but we're actually doing a decent amount of uh, commercial office work right now. 
Uh, we do do a lot of you know adaptive reuse of older buildings, you know, for multiple uses. Uh, Mike, we're down at um, Attleboro a couple weeks ago uh, together, where we did, we're converting an old historical mill to workforce housing. You know, and that's really a big challenge. To your point, Bob, where the biggest challenge that we all face in, in every industry, not just life sciences, is, is uh, talent. Where, where we have a real lack of supply of skilled labor and unskilled labor in, in, in mass and really nationally. Um, you know, but in the construction trades in particular, there's a real lack of labor. You know, that's why you see a lot of uh, wage inflation right now. Uh, there's a lot of competition for a finite supply of labor. You know, so we're kind of seeing that across the board. And we have, we work in a broad region. We work as far west as, you know, Western Mass. And we're working for some of our life science clients out there. In Central Mass, we're out near Worcester, you know, Marlboro, though, that whole area is really hot. Uh, southeast, like I just mentioned, down uh you know, not just at our boat, but New, New Bedford, you know, Bridgewater, as far north as New Hampshire. So we're seeing life science work everywhere, which is great. It's a, it's a sector that, that uh, we do a lot of work in. And uh, we're very blessed, I think, to, to, to be part of this ride here in Boston. And uh, we should give, uh, you know, the whole panel a shout out because you guys have all been in the, in, in the state at a leadership level at some point in your careers. And really the public-private partnership in Massachusetts, I think the last 20 years is what's helped build the life science, you know, community into what it is now and uh you know for us in the service industry you know we're, we're blessed you know we're, we're now the you know boston's life science capital of the world uh you could argue with the healthcare capital of the world the higher ed capital of the world top five financial market in the country uh so we've got a lot of infrastructure here that is just always going to drive you know the the economy you know and uh so we're very blessed but the the, the shortage of labor i think is going to be something that is uh is the biggest challenge to, to, to meet the demand that's out there and that, that's not just in our industry. Everybody I talk to, architects, engineers, OPMs, you know, owners, you know, whether they're on the real estate property side, I think we're all competing for the same, same pool. And uh, it does get into how do we attract more people to, you know, come up into this region to work. And obviously we have to retain the ones who do. You know, the kids who graduate colleges, which we are doing much better on. There was an exodus, I think the stat was somewhere around 50% a few years back. We're doing a lot better retaining our our, our you know, kids who come out of school, but we, we certainly need to figure out a way to get more people up here. And then obviously, Mike, I know what's what's near and dear to your heart and, and, and Governor Baker's heart and, uh, you know, Karen Polito's heart is the workforce housing. Certainly a shortage of that. You know, we, we need to sort of develop and, and make it affordable, you know, because eventually uh, as things become less and less affordable, that, that bubble eventually will burst and people will choose to, you know, go elsewhere, you know, so... Um, I, I think we need to have a continued public-private partnership working together to try to solve, solve that problem as well. You know, so I know I kind of pivoted a little bit off of the, uh, the, the question on office, but you know, I, I think there's a lot of other things that are positive, and this is kind of about Middlesex 3, but there's a lot of people who are outside of the, the Middlesex card who are also on, on the call. So um, I see a lot of great things. We work up and down Middlesex 3 card in virtually every town that, that, that's part of that region, uh, again, in, in, in multiple sectors. You know, so. Um, I don't know if I answer the question. I know I pivoted a little bit and spun it, but um, I'll, I'll drop the mic right there. We, we can hand it back to you, Mike. <laughs> All really good thoughts, Steve. And I, I will say that the, I, this, our collaborative nature is really kind of core to who we are and how we, how we think and act and work. It's been that way for a long time. And I've heard Bob talk about this a, a million times, the collaboration of business, academia, and government uh, that's really has made the life sciences industry what it is here. Uh, and clearly during the pandemic, we all collaborated in, in much more intense ways. And so we will look to uh, model that going forward and keep up, keep up the good work going across sector. Um, Steve, I do want to get onto housing, but before I do that, I, I wanted to ask you a question about construction cost trends, and in particular, kind of what's happening with the supply chain these days, and how you see that evolving. It's obviously unprecedented, you know, I think really a global pandemic for the first time. So it's... You got to look at things kind of at a holistic level initially and then understand how they apply to us, you know, naturally then locally. Um, we certainly think have the worst of it is behind us. Uh, you know, two primary drivers of the lumber industry and the steel industry, because they affect virtually everything that's manufactured. You know, so the peak of the lumber, lumber industry was July and those costs are already starting to come back down. Um, in the soft lumber industry, that is. Um, and the big driver there was really the housing market, but the, the single market housing started to cool off in July and you saw it drop about 20%. On average, it's going to be about a 41% increase in the lumber market for this year, but they expect that to go down about 29% by the end of Q, Q1 of 2022. So the good news there is, is the lumber industry is back fully staffed to pre-COVID 
levels. So they're going to start to catch up on the, uh, on the demand side. Uh, the downside to that is that's really on the softwood side. A lot of your specialty stuff, uh, your, your, your plywoods, which is needed for manufacturing a lot of things, that's, that won't correct itself to probably Q3, Q4. And even in the steel market, it's actually very much the same. Uh, structural steel was up 22, 23%. The miscellaneous, which is all the sheet goods, was up about 24, 25%. Um, some as much as 400% for real specialty goods. Um, and the structural market is, again, both globally and, and domestically, back to pre-COVID staffing levels. So again, they're going to be able to gain on the supply. Uh, you'll start to see by Q1, Q2, the, all the structural prices get back to pre-COVID levels. But on the miscellaneous side, again, which is really important, because all you, everything you do in life sciences is you're manufacturing stuff out of aluminum, stainless steel, sometimes copper. That those those sheet good materials really won't uh, correct themselves to probably Q3, Q4 of next year. So one, you have a supply issue, but two, you have a you know a cost issue, which then gets into you know inflation discussions. So what's real inflation? What's false inflation? You know, I think I think wage inflation is actually a good barometer for what is real inflation. I think we have some serious wage inflation going on right now. So that's that's that, that's an, uh, another issue. But uh, but so from a supply chain standpoint. You're going to see a lot of the, the bigger stuff start to correct itself by Q1 and Q2. And again, that'll, that'll flow right through the pricing levels. But the specialty stuff is probably still lagging till Q3, Q4. Okay, got it. Thank you, Steve. Well, let's talk about housing. I'll, I'll kind of throw this one open for anybody who wants to address it. Uh, but we've been saying for a very long time here in, in the Baker Fleet administration that the state's in the middle of a housing crisis. We simply have not produced enough housing over the last 30 years to keep up with demand. Our, our housing production in the last 30 years is, is literally half what it was in the prior 30 year period of time. If you look at this period of time from 1960 to 1990 to 2020. Um, and so we're at a time when our economy is growing, our population is growing, our housing production has fallen off and supply and demand being what it is. We've seen some of the, fat, the highest and fastest growing rents and home values of anywhere in the country. Um, it, just throw this open for folks who want to react to it, but uh, talk about how, how you're seeing the housing crisis play out in the communities where you're operating. And what are some of the major steps we need to take to address it? I will say from our standpoint, we try to come at it a couple different ways. One is by by directly funding the, the production or preservation of affordable housing, about a billion and a half dollars so far to produce 20,000 units. Um, and the other is through zoning reform. So we got done some very important zoning reform this year in the form of the governor's housing choice proposal. But I'd love to hear the thoughts generally on the housing crisis, how to combat it, and just what do you think it means for our long-term competitiveness as a state? Yeah, so I certainly want to thank you and Jay and, and Governor Baker for everything you've done to keep a spotlight on this. It, it's so important. And uh, you know, just to be clear, we talked about different uh, sectors of the commercial part market and, and whether demand is there. To be very clear, the demand is there for new housing, uh, for uh, single family housing, for multifamily housing, particularly in that middle market workforce uh, housing uh, um, a, a segment of the market. And uh, so if, despite the increase in construction prices, which has been tough on us, uh, but we've been building at, at Redgate, we built uh, about a thousand of those middle market units in the last five years. And, and we'd love to build uh, a thousand more. We built them in, in Chelsea and, and Revere and, and other places where we've been able to produce a reasonably priced unit, a market rate unit without affordable subsidy, but a reasonably priced unit. And frankly, it's been fun to see and hear how many of those units are being filled by young professionals coming from around the country, like Bob was saying, in tech and biotech, um, uh, moving from Kansas City and Texas and uh, super excited because they got a great new job here in Massachusetts. So that's got to be part of the fuel. And I, I think, Secretary, that what you've the model that you presented of public-private partnership really applies here. The, the demand for it is there. So it's really developers working with communities and with the state to identify uh, places where um, um, uh, housing works and, and really contributes to the life and the vitality of the community. Uh, but we just need a lot of those uh, places and um, the housing market will be there and those places will get filled uh, really as soon as the opportunity presents itself. So I'd love for all the communities to think of it in the way Bob Coughlin described, really, that it's part of your economic competitiveness to think about, are there places you're creating jobs for all these uh, uh, young people to work? Are you creating places for them to live and not, and not a, an hour away or two hours away? That doesn't cut it. 
Um, so uh, hopefully everyone takes away the message that to continue part of your economic competitive, not just to attract a great life sciences company, but to figure out uh, how to have all those uh, great new employees living in your community as well. Terrific, great. Other thoughts? On yeah, yeah I'd, I'd add upon that, and especially thinking about Middlesex 3 and thinking about um, the housing uh, crisis uh, that we are all um, suffering through right now. Um, as, as Greg has just suggested, um, there is a direct tie in an employer's mind between where I'm going to put the jobs and where my employees are going to live. Yes. And what we're hearing, not only from Massachusetts, but around the country, is that employers are going to locate jobs where employees are, as opposed to what was always the reverse, right? Let's bring all the bo uh, jobs to the Boston, and then we'll get public transportation to bring people in. What I've heard from employers over and over again is that we like suburban locations because housing is available in suburban locations and people can get back and forth and don't have to worry about traveling in the city. But what they say in the same breath is, but we're not seeing suburban locations build enough housing. That's right. So we're seeing rent prices go up. We know how difficult it is uh, to get projects permitted. Uh, we know how difficult um, it is to get projects permitted because there are restrictions being put on it on the local level in terms of the types of housing that can be built and where that can be built. And it really is going to lead to a further mismatch um, a further uh, stress of our economy if we don't get the housing piece right so that the jobs can go. Because as Bob Coughlin has suggested, and Bob, I'll turn it over to you next, as Bob Coughlin has suggested, there are opportunities that exist today that have never existed before for commercial development, but they won't be realized unless you're building housing as well. Bob? Thank, thank you. And, and both Greg and Jay, you hit it right on. And housing is equally as important. That middle market housing is equally, if not more important than any other issue right now, more so than ever. And in my new role at GLL, I run the national life science practice. So we are working on site selection for companies from all over the world to put them in places all over the country. And we put ourselves at a huge competitive disadvantage when we don't have workforce housing. And so my, the message that I, I want, in, you know, Greg talked about this, if, if municipalities are looking at how they can position themselves to be very attractive, not just to create these jobs and create the building that has research development and many clinical manufacturing in it, you need to, the, these companies are going to say, okay, show me the housing that's around it. Show me the amenities that are around it. Where do people go to eat? It all comes back to live, work, play. And Jay is 100% correct. In the days of old, it was let's put everybody in these densely populated R&D clusters, and then we'll figure out how to get them in and out with public transportation. That is not the case right now. It is not the case. So uh, I'm not saying public transportation isn't important. It's very, very important. But we also need to think of housing around all of these different, I call them pioneering markets. So Bob, you and I talked the other day on our call about how more and more lately, we're seeing tenants who come to tour, you know, parks and, and businesses and their HR representatives are part of the tour. Absolutely. Because, you know, that had kind of disappeared for a little bit. You know, there are real estate departments making real estate decisions mm -hmm. and we've kind of come full circle. HR departments are being a part of the conversation because uh, employee retention their happiness in the space that they're building, that they're asking them to come work at. Um, they're absolutely asking, what are the amenities in the area? What can my employees take advantage of without having to go far away? So I think that all those things that you mentioned, we are actively seeing those things asked in tours every day. It's very important for companies to build that work, live, play atmosphere. Yeah. Absolutely. Steve, you wanna jump in on housing? Sure. I mean, I, I'd like to, you know, th there's kind of a, a negative connotation with a lot of towns that they all want to have the economies booming, but they don't want to have the multi-unit housings, you know, in their backyard per se. And I think that's one of the challenges. A lot of developers are trying to get these developments into the pipeline, but we're in mass, every town has its own jurisdiction and own, own zoning and controls and makes it more difficult than in other states where that's managed at a statewide level. You know, so I think the, and I know there's some folks in towns on, on this, uh, you know, listening to, to the panel today, some towns are very forward thinking and understand the direct correlation between, you know, building workforce housing, then building their own tax bases, which can then fund their schools and their police officers and their firefighters, and some people don't. And I think that the, the largest challenge is people want to spend the money. There's a ton of capital to be invested here in, in, in Boston. I think we're, we're one of the tops in the world in terms of where VC money comes. 
but we need to get the workforce housing in place so we can and then hit the demand on what we're trying, all our growth cycles. So I think the key to that is that that public private, you know, partnership slash relationship. What you guys are doing at the state level, Mike, is great, but we need to get it to where the, the, the local towns are embracing and, and being more welcoming to the approval process. And it can't be, you know, three or four people who've lived in the town for 20 years making a decision on their, their opinions. It should be more fact and law-based versus the opinion of someone who may not understand the, the holistic uh, approach to growing an economy and, and a thriving, you know, town or city, you know? So I think that's the key is how do you unlock that to make people more, more receptive and open and make the path to construction easier for the developers like Greg and, and, and those folks are in that, that world to get projects into the pipeline and get them approved, you know, faster. All really, really good thoughts on a really important topic. I, I did touch on um, the zoning reform issue. So if folks don't know this, this housing choice uh, legislation, part of the economic development bill, the legislature uh, passed and the governor signed in January, uh, lowers the local approval threshold from a super majority down to a simple majority for about nine different types of what we call housing best practices. And so as Steve alluded to, all, all, all zoning decisions are local decisions. We have 351 cities and towns, they're all different, they all have their own prerogatives and strategies, but they're all, those are all local zoning decisions. And um, what Housing Choice does simply is lowers that threshold from two thirds to a simple majority. We think it's gonna have the effect of unlocking production of all types of housing all across the state. I think it's really, really important. But as Steve alluded to, it does depend on an individual cities and towns saying that they want more housing and having the will to make it happen. So uh, it's very, very important. Um, and and Mike, can I just add on that? Well, just one yeah. thing, just a, a plug for, for Middlesex 3 and the kind of uh, cross-town regional collaboration that it represents, because yes. you do, I know you've seen, and we've all seen that uh, one of the uh, arguments, if you will, that individual cities and towns make is, well, if I were to approve some new housing in my community but it, you know are other communities doing their share or am i being am i doing more than my share and uh I, that's just one of the great opportunities of the middle sex three is you can collectively right you can talk about how you want to grow your the life sciences industry collectively and make decisions that reinforce and allow this to become a great cluster but you can also talk collectively about housing decisions and how if each of you uh, does uh, take some steps to allow some more housing, then collectively that could have a very big impact. So uh, this kind of uh, local, very voluntary, very collaborative uh, regional uh, partnership, I think is one of the keys to success. It's, it's a really good point, Greg. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, but for a whole lot of reasons, the, the decisions will be uh, made locally, but that doesn't mean we can't think regionally and, and plan regionally. And Middlesex 3 has been a real leader in that regard. It, it's, a, it's a really, really good point and important way to, to think about the problem and the opportunity. Um, I want to uh, talk about uh, some more about life sciences and then, and then go on to talk about some other industry clusters. But in terms of, of life sciences, what do municipalities have to do to attract life sciences employers? And, and Bob, I don't know if you want to start us off with that one, but others ought to feel free to jump in as well. But what um, what, what will it take for a city and town to attract life sciences these days? Well, it, it's a great question. And when you when I talked a little bit earlier about the direction the industry is going in, and just so the audience understands, when, when I talk about clinical GNP, I mean about the manufacturing of product that these early stage companies need to make to use in clinical trials. This isn't manufacturing of approved drugs that actually go to patients. In the old days, a lot of these companies would outsource to what are called contract manufacturers. And they would outsource it to contract manufacturers, some in, in, in Asia, some of them you know, in other parts of the country here. And those industries, uh, those businesses got very busy and companies lost their opportunity to control their timeline by outsourcing the manufacturing of clinical products. Some of it because of COVID, some of it because it, with the global supply chain being broken, and some of it be, being because this industry has gotten so busy with cell and gene therapy and precision medicine. We don't invent pills that create, create that uh, treat the symptoms of disease anymore. These are personalized medicines that change the course of disease and in some cases cure disease. So what does that mean? It means that if they're going to control their own destiny and timeline, it makes more sense for them to make clinical product themselves. Okay, we went to an area of outsourcing a lot because it made sense. 
industry changed. It makes more sense to make these clinical products now to have more control over it and do it quicker, better, faster. They're not gonna do this in inner city environments, right? So this is creating that sprawl. So like Deanna alluded to and, and Greg alluded to, you look at like 100 Crosby in, in Bedford or 10 McGuire in Lexington, these, uh, these little campuses are gonna have the ability to do RD and clinical M, really cool. They, even if they're gonna have R&D efforts that uh, are happening in South Boston in the Seaport or in Kendall Square or the more traditional R&D clusters, they like to be close, right? So that those folks can interact. So we're seeing this growth overflow into you know, these pioneering markets because the industry has changed. And, and, and again, it, it's a great, great opportunity for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'll throw a little, I'm a, 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 I've been an optimist my whole life, right? But the reality is we are losing a lot of these opportunities to North Carolina right now, because 10 years ago, North Carolina came up, up with a really amazing way to tr uh, train workers uh, on how to use these reactors and whatnot. Are we doing it in Massachusetts now? Yes, we are, but we got a lot more work to do. So, you know, when you look at the, the evolution of the life sciences industry, it's really, really a huge opportunity for us to, you know, cre create and, and, and benefit from these biomanufacturing jobs. Does, does that answer your question, Mike? Am I missing Yeah, it sure does, Bob. And we, we certainly agree, as you know, the idea that we can have yeah. life sciences truly be a statewide opportunity. So what uh, do those municipalities need then? They need the water. I almost forgot. I ADD'd out on your question. The, uh, the, they need the access to water, access to sewer, power. These are the types of infrastructure needs that the municipalities need. And they also need permitting that allows for manufacturing in those towns. If you can pre-permit, you're gonna have an advantage over other municipalities that don't because time is of the most importance. The reason you see so many conversions right now is because you can pick up 12 months as it relates to permitting, permitting from doing purpose-built ground up. I think purpose-built ground up wins at the end of the day, but right now conversions are a great way to meet the need that we have immediately. Got it, terrific, thanks, Bob. Others wanna jump in on that point about attracting life sciences? I think the other big thing there, and Bob touched on it, is speed to market. It's our biggest challenge right now. Um, it takes a long time to build lab space. It takes even longer with the supply chain issues. And I think Steve would agree with me. Every day a job gets a notice about one or another piece of critical equipment that is sitting somewhere. It's just not where it's supposed to be yet. So building out the, these types of uses take a long time. Tenants are in general 12 to 18 months out from using their space when they commit to us. So I think that at some point, you know, our supply is going to run short a little bit because all of the stuff that we are, we're just going at 100% right now, it's leasing before we can even see the finish line on completing it. And then those folks are going to move in and you're going to start that process all over again. So Back to Steve's point from way back, I'm hoping that our supply chain issues catch up and improve in the next 12 months. There was one other thing that I wanted to mention when it comes to building space and everything, all of our struggles. We talked a lot earlier about labor issues when it comes to the folks who are going to work in labs and, and things like that. Right now, we have a labor issue in the folks who are building labs and building these offices. And I, I think Steve would agree with me that the trade shortage is a right now problem as well. So I'll, I'll hit on a couple things. I didn't want to let that go without talking about the importance of the folks yeah. who build the space that we're all hoping that people will use. Really important point. So, so a couple of things that the, the panelists mentioned. So another, uh, you know, cog in the whole supply chain is uh, just the ports themselves. There's again, not, not enough labor uh, working the ports, getting the trucks they loaded and, and distributed. So, you know, just a couple of data points. It used to take about 35 days on average for a container to make it from China to LA. Uh, at the June 3rd, I'm sorry, uh, September 30th, they had, I think, uh, 68 um, ships out there loaded, ready to be offloaded, which is the most they've ever had. And on average, it's now taken 78 days for that to get offloaded. So, the, so not only do you have a, you know, the constraints in the manufacturing process, but once it gets here, it's sitting in the, in the harbor for you know, 78 days waiting to be offloaded and then distributed around the country. So that's that's one huge issue we need to solve just from a distribution uh, standpoint. 
Uh, Bob touched on, you know, the, the infrastructure needs. So we, we do a lot of reuse of, of existing buildings. But when you start going into like a CGMP, you know, facilities, the, the demands they have a much more intense infrastructure, water, sewer, but you know, the power can be three, four, five times what, what the, these buildings currently have for service you know, available. So there's a lot of infrastructure improvements that, that need to be made to, to, to accommodate a lot of these buildings to try to make it work. But it inevitably it usually happens because the, the speed to market play is huge. You know, if it's a 12 month differential in the life science world, that, that's, that's dramatic. It's you know, seen you know, success and failure in, in a lot of cases. And I'm going to bring it back to the permitting and approvals. It's a different sector, but we also do, you know, uh, hospitality. So we were building a ground up hotel about uh, 10 years ago. And that, that same developer had at the start of the process on the same parallel path, coincidentally, in North Carolina, which Bob just drew, drew reference to in the life science world. But he had his, his hotel uh, submitted for permits, designed, built before we even had our permits up here in Massachusetts, right? So it, it took him three or four years to go through the process to get the approval. We're down in North Carolina, they were much more receptive to it. And, you know, in the same time, we eventually built it, but you know, he's probably three three years later by the time we got out to the market from, from that. So you can draw that same parallel to, to the to life science community right now. Um, so I, I think that, that there's a lot there, you know, um, and, and certainly to the end point, we have a huge shortage of labor in the construction trades nationally. Uh, it's a little bit older data, but 2016, the average age of a superintendent nationally was 54 years old. And that just shows you not enough, you know, kids are going to the trades. And, and that, that's, I think, again, a holistic problem. We're in the 80s. Most people said, all oh, your kids go to college, college, college. Well, the reality is college isn't the right play for a lot of kids. You should put, make it cool again to be a cop and to, to, to be an electrician, to be an HVAC technician. Those guys are making and girls two, three hundred thousand dollars a year because there's there's not enough of them. You know, by by twenty thirty, there's a big cliff with all the skilled labor in the country. And the kids who go in the trades now are gonna make a lot of money with no college debt, where the kids will all be forced to go to college where they should or should not. You know, some some obviously it's the right choice for, for certain kids, but it's not the right choice for every kid, you know. And I think we have to uh, you know encourage and make it cool again to actually learn a trade and, 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 and have a skill, you know? And I think that's something uh, that, again, that, that's a high level holistic public private thing we need to work together on to solve that problem, you know? Well, we, I, we certainly agree with that one, Steve. It's a really important point. We've, we've had an effort now, really going back to the early days of the administration uh, where the governor formed something called the Workforce Skills Cabinet, which is the Secretary of Economic Development, Labor and Education and our, our mandate and Jay was, was part of this in the beginning, was, was how do we think about closing skills gaps and building more robust talent pipelines around the state in a few key areas, healthcare, IT, advanced manufacturing, and the trades. And so there, there's a real, real demand there. And as you said, there are real opportunities there. Uh, there's a question in the Q&A around, around local zoning as being an impediment for life science. Does anybody want to touch on that one? Are we seeing that uh, on the ground today? Bob, I'm going to expand the question and ask if I could, uh, Secretary, to ask Bob the question. We hear this all the time from communities. We want to be a life sciences community. Um, Bob, the question um, in the chat is, you know, uh, distribution is taking up lots of land that could go to life sciences. My question to you is, is every community a life sciences community or should communities do an assessment, an internal assessment as to what they are likely to get and then plan their zoning accordingly? I'd, I'd love to hear you respond to that. It's a great question, Jay. And one of the things that MassBio is working on now, I'm not the CEO of MassBio anymore, but I'm still on the board and I'm on the Economic Development Advisory Group subcommittee. Uh, they're coming out with a guide for municipalities on what it takes to actually be set up in a way that is friendly to the life sciences industry. If you don't have sewer, there's a good chance you're not going to capitalize on, uh, you know, GMP uh, uh, purpose. It's not going to happen. So there's, there's things like that. So when you look at the bio-ready community standards, you know, first it comes down to, you've got to make sure that your town bylaws don't exclude certain types of research. These are just outdated town ordinance and bylaws. Simple things like that, that town meeting can change. All the way up to having pre-permitted sites that are ready to go. A lot of municipalities won't let you get permitted for this use unless you have that tenant in hand. And then it's going to take another year just to go through the town meeting process. Well, that that's not going to work because these companies don't have that time. Time is more important than money in many cases. So there, there's so many, like you use the town of Norwood as an example right now. They weren't a very bio-friendly community in years of past, but look what they've been able to do by changing you know, the way they're set up and now Moderna has a big 
you know, biomanufacturing facility down there. And that, that whole route one corridor now is very attractive to companies that want to do GMP. So yeah, it, you know, you got to have the power, you got to have the sewer, you got to have land available that's permitted and ready to go. It helps a ton if you have a director of economic development that works in that town that can be that ombudsman, that, that, that direct point of contact, kind of like the Life Science Center is for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It works so well. It works so well to have that one point of contact. So, you know, you drill that down into the community level and, and you know, keep your eyes open because I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but Mass Bio is working with all of their partners, Mass Econ and the Mass Life Science Center to make sure that this guide for municipalities is ready after the first of the year and can get out there to everybody. Terrific, great. Let me, uh, very helpful guys. Let me uh, turn to Greg with a question on, on demand for, for retail and restaurant space. What, 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 what are you seeing now today uh, you know, coming out of the pandemic for demand for that type of space? Well, it's, you know, it's uh, similar to what we talked about for office space. I mean, it's even more struggling than that. So that the, the there's really very few people thinking forward about new construction and development in retail and restaurant. And the focus is on how do you manage the existing inventory and sort of avoid those distress situations that I was talking about uh, earlier. So it, it's a big focus. And I know, you know, again, compliments to you, Secretary and Governor Baker, huge emphasis on small business support uh, across the state. Great example of public private partnership. We we have come to realize and appreciate more than ever that a lot of these local businesses are really anchors of our community and what we like about our communities and they need help and they weren't going to make it and it and it was going to take a public private partnership to get them through so the focus i think probably your shop you're seeing it and i think the market seeing is really focused on how to help uh, existing locations survive and you know, fill in the infill that, you know, despite our best efforts, there is some vacancy there and there is some infill. The only, the only re real new development that we're seeing is very consistent what we've, what we've been talking about, about the need to have live, work, play. So you do see new developments that are primarily housing or primarily commercial office lab saying, you know, to be attractive in this marketplace, we do need to have some amenities. So, for example, we often put a fun restaurant in the first floor of our apartment communities. Frankly, we charge very little rent because it's not about making money out of that space. It's about making the whole building more attractive to our tenants and users. So you do that's where most of the new restaurant retail you're seeing is as an amenity, I think, to other larger mixed use uh, projects. And we just, uh, the focus has to be on really stabilizing who's around because you know, we, we, if you, some of those are restaurant, our best restaurant or retail operators are people who've been in the business for a long time and they're making some tough decisions. You know, we've seen it, right? About whether they want to keep going in the business. Maybe this is the time that is, I've worked in this industry for 20 years and worked too hard. And maybe this is the sign that I should be done. Um, and we don't want that to happen. We don't want uh, the talented entrepreneurs who are doing all those things to give yeah. up on their town and on Massachusetts. And, and I think we're still though in that triage stage of how do we help the existing folks get through um, before we start building anything new. I uh, really good point, Greg, absolutely. Uh, well, we got uh, any one more minute left. There was a question in the, on the Q and A around distribution centers and should we be concerned about um, how many of those are being built and there are they crowding out uses, other uses of such space? So maybe if someone wants to touch on that one quickly and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. I can throw out there that, you know, about 15 years ago, the uh, occupancy rate in industrial space in the state was only around 40%, and now it's at 99%. There's not enough of it in the built environment, so a lot of it's being built. Uh, obviously, the, a lot around the CGMP stuff in, in, in the biotech space, but also, uh, you know, the whole last mile delivery, you know, and, and, and I think it's, it's, it's here. It's part of the future. It's necessary if you're going to have, again, that whole distribution network. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, I think, again, towns need to be receptive to it. It tends to be more in the, the you know, rural area where there's big, big, big plots of dirt you can grab and throw up a 100,000, 200,000, 500,000, or a million footer, you know, and uh, they're, they're, they're going up in a lot of places. I can tell you that much. Yeah. And I just add, it's another example of why communities, the communities that do the best zoning are planning ahead. 
And your decision about what happens with the land in your community shouldn't be reactive to really oh, we, hear, we see yeah. Amazon sniffing around, frankly, or frankly, Bob, with all due respect, we see a big biotech sniffing around, right? You should be, because yeah. also it's too late. It's going to take uh, that company is sniffing around is not going to be interested because you're not ready for them. So yeah. for all of these uses, figure out, do you want them? Do you not want them? Do you want them in certain parts of town? That includes multifamily housing. You don't have to open door everywhere. Uh, do your own planning, decide what you want your future to look like. And frankly, the developers will thank you because it'll be easier. They'd rather be told, yes, you're welcome here. And no, you're going to have a tough time there. Works better for everybody. Really, really good points. I, I think uh, I think Stephanie and Rick are gonna are gonna cut us off here, but before they do, I just I want to thank this incredible panel. It's been a real honor to facilitate this discussion. What a terrific group! And and I do want to thank Stephanie Middlesex three for being such great partners. Um, you know, since the pandemic started, uh, I think one of the more important things we did was open up a dialogue, a weekly dialogue back then with all of our business groups around the state, and it was enormously helpful for us to hear what's happening on the ground in our communities from our business groups and. And Stephanie and the folks at Middlesex 3 have been incredible partners in that regard. So uh, well, great to be with you all. And Rick, thank you for bringing us together today. Really, really terrific discussion. No, no, thank thank you. Uh, and, and thank you for this this whole um, di dialogue as well, too. I'm not going to cut you off. If you guys want to continue the conversation, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll stay here. Um, but, but but I want to be mindful of everyone's time as well, yeah. too. So, um, but but thank you. I know we had a, a lot of topics that we wanted to, to cover, and I think we touched upon most of them, if not all of them. And obviously, it's just uh, a, a short conversation, and there's there's a lot more detail we could get into. But uh, but but thank you for for all your uh, information, insights, um, thoughts. A lot of great points that we talked about, and and a lot of uh, things for us, um, whether it's the coalition or the the municipalities, to to really take to heart and to run with as well too. So thank you for, for that conversation. Um, I know I know many of you need to leave um, on on the panel as, as well as as our attendees. Um, but if you want to continue the conversation, um, we're we're going to continue it um, as a dialogue. Um, but uh, but feel free to jump off as well too. Um, but before you jump off, I do want to first thank you. Uh, thank you, Secretary uh, Keneally, uh, Jay Yash, Steve Kelly, Deanna Murphy, um, Greg Bilecki, Bob Coughlin. I appreciate all, all the conversations. Um, and, um, and and Rick, I know you need to thank our sponsors as well too. So I'll stop talking for a second. No, well, not that I need to. I want to. Okay. Uh, but I, I want to also mention that if, you know, you talked about live, work, and play, you know, if anyone has a chance, go down and see Steve Kelly's operation in Canton. You, if you worked there, you would never want to leave. He's got everything you would ever want. <laughs> so I can't, I can't believe you can't attract new employees, Steve. <laughs> Well, to be honest with you, like, we, we did that strategically. So a couple of years back, uh, we, our, our HQ is down in Canton. And we're competing with downtown Boston, which is a very many rich environment. So to try to get uh, employees that want to come to the suburbs, we had to really build an many rich campus. So it was all strategic in terms of you know, working towards talent acquisition, but then also you know talent retention, you know, and helping build the culture of the company. But it's we had to build a very many rich campus uh, because you are competing sometimes with you know places like downtown for for the for the labor at least that we have to we have to attract. You know, great, great. Well, you you attracted me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could go there every day. It's pretty cool. I'm pretty, pretty happy with the way it came up. For those who don't know, we had a big Oktoberfest here in uh, October. We had about 550 people and we had a band up on the roof, the U2 cover band, Joshua Tree. So Rick was uh, obviously one of the folks who was invited down and, and came. We're going to run it back next year. So COVID will hopefully be over and we'll have about a thousand people here. It'll be, it'll be pretty awesome. Well, that was that was incredible, Steve. I got I to gotta applaud you for that. <laughs> Thanks, buddy.